السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I'm Dr. Maha Abu Hashim, Professor of Pathology on Sura Faculty of Medicine. Today in this lecture we will uh, speak about fibroblastic and fibrohistiocytic bone lesions. Our objectives are to discuss fibrous and fibrohistiocytic bone lesions as regards their classification, incidence, clinical presentation, radiological features, gross and microscopic appearance, differential diagnosis including immune histochemistry and molecular markers. To these lesions, about the classification of these lesions, we have the group of fibrous lesions and the group of fibrohistiocytic lesions. The group of fibrous lesions include non-ossifying fibroma, also known as metaphyseal fibrous defect or fibrous cortical defects. Second, we have dysmoplastic fibroma, primary fibrosarcoma of bone, solitary fibrous tumor, uh, previously uh, known as hemangiopericytoma. These are the fibrous lesions of bone. Fibrohistocytic bone lesions include benign fibrous histocytoma of bone and primary malignant fibrous histocytoma of bone. Now, starting with uh, the first example of fibrous bone tumor, is non-ossifying fibroma or fibrous cortical defect. Both are the same lesion. However, fibrous cortical defect affects only the cortex of bone, while non-ossifying fibroma affects the cortex in addition to the medulla of bone. So, the lesion is a benign fibroblastic proliferation associated with osteoclast type giant cells. So this is one of the bone lesions with excessive giant cells that are present and it is uh, included in the differential diagnosis of uh, giant cell rich bone lesions. Uh, this lesion may be fibrous cortical defect affecting only the cortex of bone or when it is called non-ossifying fibroma it is the same lesion however it involves the medulla in addition to the cortex. Clinically this lesion is a non-neoplastic process that occurs in the juxta epiphyseal region of lung bones. It affects skeletally immature individuals. It affects uh, uh, young adults or adolescents, males being affected more than females. This lesion is usually asymptomatic and it is incidentally discovered. Uh, regarding the site of this lesion, it affects the metaphysis of the distal femur, proximal tibia, then the distal tibia. So it affects long bones, femur and tibia. The lesion normally regresses spontaneously, so it is very important to diagnose this lesion as it, is, it requires no treatment. So it is uh, very important uh, to include all the differentials of this lesion as when you diagnose non-ossifying fibroma, the surgeon will do just nothing. So this lesion normally regresses spontaneously. The only definite indication to treat the lesion or to treat non-ossifying fibroma is that if it produces pathological fracture. Radiologically, the lesion, this is non-ossifying fibroma. It includes the cortex and medulla. The lesion is eccentric with well-defined sclerotic borders. Here's the 
fibrous cortical defect. It affects the cortex with it is an osteolytic lesion with very well defined border and sclerotic rim. So in radiology and radiology may be quite enough for diagnosis of the lesion. We have a lithic eccentric uh, lesion with sharp margin and surrounded by sclerotic rim that involves the cortex if it is fibrous cortical defect and can extend into the medullary cavity it is called then non-ossifying fibrosis. It has a lobulated contour that may be asymmetric. Radiologic features can be quite characteristic so as in most cases biopsy is not required. Grossly, the lesion is eccentric, red-brown and focally yellow due to accumulation of uh, foamy histiocytes. It is well circumscribed with sclerotic borders. Now, the histological features will include three main items. First, cellular proliferation of spindle-shaped cells with a story form pattern. Spindle cells with a story form pattern. Second is osteoclast type giant cells evenly distributed within the tumor. Third here are foamy histiocytes that may engulf uh, extravasated uh, RBCs and contain hemosiderin pigment. So we have spindle shaped fibroblasts, osteoclast type giant cells, and foamy histiocytes. So the histologic features include hypercellular tumor, forming of plump spindle fibroblasts, arranged in a story form pattern. Here, Mitosis are few or infrequent. We have here osteoclast type giant cells scattered throughout the tumor. Here we have hemocytrin and foamy macrophares are common. Sometimes we have necrosis and especially uh, in settings of fracture or if the lesion is associated with fracture we can uh, encounter small foci of necrosis. Here, spindle-shaped fibroblasts arranged in a story form pattern. Here is osteoclast type giant cells. Here are osteoclast type giant cells evenly distributed within the tumor. And here is the story form pattern of the spindle-shaped cells. Now, it's very important to include all the differential for non-ossifying fibroma because if we have excluded all the possibilities and the tumor is only non-ossifying fibroma or fibrous cortical defect, there will be no further surgical interference. So, considering the osteoclast type giant cell, the first differential is giant cell tumor of bone. But remember, in giant cell tumor of bone, it is an epithelial lesion that may extend to the metaphysis. It affects elder age group. And here there is no, in giant cell tumor of bone, there is no story form arrangement of the spindle shaped cells. So the first differential giant cell tumor in non-ossifying fibroma osteoclast giant cells are fewer and less nucleated and it doesn't extend to the joint surface giant cell tumor is epiphyseal also age of giant cell tumor is elder site is epiphyseal now the second differential considering the spindle cell proliferation is dysmoplastic fibroma. Dysmoplastic fibroma of bone is a locally aggressive intraosseous uh, dysmoid tumor. In dysmoplastic fibroma, 
like the fibroblast does not acquire the story form pattern. In addition, in desmoplastic fibroma, it has infiltrative border with excessive collagen lay now. So, desmoplastic fibroma, which is a locally aggressive intraosseous desmoid tumor, it lacks giant cells and osseous metaplasia, and it shows spindle uh, collagenous fascicles with no story for pattern. Third, also considering the fibrous proliferation, is fibrosarcoma or leomyosarcoma of bone. The tumor here is hypercellular with increased mitosis and pleomorphism. The next differential, considering the foamy histiocyte, is metastatic renal cell carcinoma. Here also we have foamy cells. However, in renal cell carcinoma, the neoplastic cells are cytokeratin positive. Next differential is benign fibrous histocytoma of bone. Benign fibrous histocytoma of bone has the same histology. However, it occurs in other sites and in elder patients. So, benign fibrous histocytoma has similar histology, but the tumor is bigger in elder patients and at site not that of non-ossifying fibroma. It can affect the vertebrae or flat bones. The last differential is xanthomatous post-traumatic fibro-osseous lesion. This is a post-traumatic lesion that affects bone. Here in, post, in the xanthomatous post-traumatic fibro-osseous lesion, we have the zonation phenomena. We have areas of woven bone that matures to lamellar bone without giant cells. To summarize, clinically, how to diagnose non-ossifying fibroma? If you have eccentric metaphysial lesion in a skeletally immature individual, just consider non-ossifying fibroma. The pathological features, we have bland, spindle-shaped fibroblasts arranged in a story form cross pattern with osteoclast-type giant cells with hemocedrin and foamy histocytes. These are the summary of non-ossifying fibroma or fibrous cortical defect. Second, fibrous lesion of bone is dysmoplastic fibroma. Dysmoplastic fibroma is a locally aggressive, extremely rare primary bone tumor. It is the intraosseous counterpart of soft tissue fibromatosis. Most lesions occur in young age, in adolescents and young adults with a peak incidence between 15 and 25 years of age. Any bone can be affected by dysmoplastic fibroma, but it is more common in uh, long bone, distal femur, and proximal uh, tibia. It is also frequent in the pelvic bone, with a special predilection to the bones of the mandible. So, flat bone of the pelvis and mandibular bone are specially affected in addition to distal femur and proximal tibia. When the tumor occurs in long bone, they are centered in the metaphysis of long bones. Radiologically, dysmoplastic fibroma has a characteristic radiological features. Dysmoplastic fibroma uh, fibromas are radiolytic that characteristically show bone expansion and they are multi-cystic lesions. Lesions are usually well defined and often have a bubbly appearance. This is a dysmoplastic fibroma of the calcaneus. The lesion here is well defined, bubbly. Here we have bubbly appearance, areas of bone destruction. 
equation in the tibia here, proximal tibia, is more or less well defined and it occurs in the metaphysis. Here, this lesion shows bone expansion with a bubbly appearance. This is a characteristic radiological feature for dysmoplastic fibroma. Grossly, due to excessive collagen laid down by the tumor, the tumor is tough, grayish white, and destructive. So grossly, dysmoplastic fibromas are extremely dense due to excessive collagen laid down, and they are gray-white and range in size from 3 to 10 cm, although sometimes it can reach 20 cm. Under the microscope, it is an infiltrative tumor. It is histologically identical to fibromatosis of soft tissue. It, they show patternless proliferation of benign appearing myofibroblasts. So we have spindle cell proliferation with no special pattern, no story form, no herring bone, no any special pattern. Uh, there is a densely collagenized stroma. Here, the bone is infiltrated. Here is the host bone, and this is spindle cell tumor with excessive collagen formation infiltrating and entrapping host bone. So, an infiltrative cross pattern is characteristic of dysmoplastic fibro. This is spindle cell proliferation, bland spindle cell with no special pattern of proliferation and with excessive collagen formation. Here, spindle cells, spindle cell proliferation, bland spindle cell with excessive collagen laid down. Now for the differential diagnosis of dysmoplastic fibroma, other spindle cell proliferation. We have low-grade fibrosarcoma of bone. In fibrosarcoma, however, uh, there is some sort of cellular asepia, occasional mitotic figure, and the pattern of spindle cell proliferation is herring bone is in a fascicular pattern. In dysmoplastic fibroma, we have no special pattern. Fibrous dysplasia. Second differential is fibrous dysplasia. You know that in fibrous dysplasia, we have metaplastic bone and fibrous tissue. If the metaplastic bone component is few, the differential diagnosis between fibrous dysplasia and uh, dysmoplastic fibroma may be quite difficult. So, uh, fibrous dysplasia that shows little woven bone may also be confused with uh, dysmoplastic fibroma. However, careful attention to the radiologic feature. Here, the, rad the radiologic features may be of great help and thorough searching for neoplastic for the neoplastic tissue for woven bone may be necessary for the diagnosis of fibrous display. The third is non ossifying fibroma. However, in non ossifying fibroma the characteristic radiological features also in non ossifying fibroma the spindle Shaped cells are arranged in a story form pattern. We have osteoclast type giant cell and we have foamy histiocytes, which are not present in dysmoplastic fibro. Third fibrous lesion of bone is primary bone fibrosarcoma. Fibrosarcoma of bone is spindle cell neoplasm that is usually low to intermediate grade of malignancy. It is composed of cellular proliferation of spindle shaped cells arranged in fascicles here or in herring bone arrangement, like the bone fish. It is composed of spindle cells arranged in fascicular herring bone pattern. In low grade tumor, the spindle cells are uniform with mild to moderate degree of 
atypian. However, in high-grade tumor, the tumors are highly cellular and contain obvious cytologic atypia with numerous mitotic fibers. Some lesions may have large amount of extracellular collagen that may be confused with dysmoplastic fibrosis. Radiologically, here it is the, all the manifestations of uh, malignant tumor with ill-defined border, cortical destruction, and soft tissue extension. However, we can't find any specific matrix, no osteoid or chondroid matrix. So it is a malignant tumor. However, we can't find any specific matrix. So this is fibrosarcoma of the distal femur with poorly defined lytic lesion centered in the cortex with an associated soft tissue extension. Here is another fibrosarcoma in the neck of the femur. It is an expansile lesion with poorly defined margin and osteolytic lesion. Under the microscope, we have fascicles of spindle-shaped cells with variable degrees of pleomorphism and mitotic figures arranged in uh, earring bone pattern. Here are the spindle-shaped cells with pleomorphism. Here the tumor is poorly cellular with excessive extracellular collagen laid down. Differential diagnosis of fibrosarcoma, the low-grade tumor, may be confused or have to be differentiated from dysmoplastic fibroma. In fibrosarcoma, the spindle cells are arranged in bundles, sometimes herring bone. The arrangement of spindle-shaped cells in uh, dysmoplastic fibroma is irregular. In fibrosarcoma, we have some sort of atypia. High-grade fibrosarcomas may be differentiated from malignant fibrocystocytoma. However, in malignant fibrocystocytoma, we have in more cellular atypia, and the spindle-shaped cells are arranged in a storyform pattern. High-grade fibrosarcoma may be differentiated also from fibroblastic osteosarcoma. However, to diagnose osteosarcoma, we have to find malignant osteoma. The last fibrous tumor of bone is solitary fibrous tumor, previously known as hemangiopericytoma. To define solitary fibrous tumor, you have to find certain criteria. So, Solitary fibrous tumor is an mesenchymal neoplasm com composed of oval to spindle shaped cells with prominent branching staghorn vascular pattern. So, in solitary fibrous tumor, you have to find the staghorn vascular pattern. Also, there is expression of CD34, this is mandatory for diagnosis, and gene translocation, a molecular marker or genetic marker must be found in to diagnose solitary fibrous tumor in problematic case. The term hemangiopericytoma is no longer used. Hemangiopericytoma of bone is not accepted, is not an accepted diagnosis in the WHO classification of bone tumor. So there is no primary bone hemangiopericytoma. There may be a metastatic hemangiopericytoma from a primary most commonly in the meninges. However, primary bone hemangiopericytoma is not uh, an accepted diagnosis. Specific genetic marker is found in cases of solitary fibrous tumor. NAP2 STAT6 gene fusion is identified in the majority of solitary fibrous tumor. So, this genetic marker may be the diagnostic clue in problematic cases to diagnose solitary fibrous tumor. Site of the lesion, spine is the most common location, usually in the sacrum or lumbar vertebrae. It can also develop in any other organ 
mostly in the lungs. Here, the radiological feature, here in the vertebrae, there is an osteolytic infiltrative lesion with soft tissue extension. So, these are the criteria of malignant tumor and this is malignant solitary fibrous tissue. Under the microscope here, the tumor is composed of oval to spindle shaped fibroblast like spindle shaped cells. Cells have uniform nuclei with a small amount of pale eosinophilic cytoplasm. The arrangement is patternless, so spindle cells have a patternless architecture. So there is a variable cellularity, sometimes hyper or hypocellular areas. A characteristic thick robe like collagen, eloid like collagen is present in the tumor. But more important is this staghorn vascular pattern with very vascular hyalinization. This is a very characteristic feature in solitary fibrous tube. So there is prominent branching staghorn hemangi or hemangiopericytoma like vascular pattern. Frequently there is a perivascular hyalinization here. In 2013, WHO, the WHO classification of soft tissue tumor, it defines malignant forms of solitary fibrous tumor as being hypercellular, mitotically active, with more than 4 mitoses per 10 high power spheres, with cytological atypia, tumor necrosis, and infiltrative margin. So, solitary fibrous tumor may be B9 psychologically benign and if it has these criteria it is a malignant variant of the solitary fibrous tumor. Now for the immunohistochemical profile of solitary fibrous tumor it must be CD34 positive. You should be very careful to diagnose solitary fibrous tumor if it is negative for CD34. The molecular marker TET6 has recently been shown to be sensitive and specific marker for solitary fibrous tumor. It can be very important for the differential diagnosis. The tumor is CD99 and BCL2 positive, and there is focal cytoplasmic staining for epithelial membrane angine and beta catenin. However, the tumor is negative for vitamin, keratin, and S100 protein. Now for the differential diagnosis of solitary fibrous tumor. First is synovial sarcoma. If it is the monophasic or the monophasic synovial sarcoma. The differential diagnosis can sometimes have very similar histologic feature to solitary fibrous tumor, monophasic synovial sarcoma. However, synovial sarcoma are usually focally keratin positive, while solitary fibrous tumor is keratin negative. In problematic cases, we have to do molecular markers for synovial sarcoma or for solitary fibrous tumor. For solitary fibrous tumors, TET6 is positive. And in synovial sarcoma, we have translocation X18. Translocation is performed to confirm the diagnosis of synovial sarcoma. So, in monophasic synovial sarcoma, we may resort to the molecular markers for the final diagnosis as histologically the two patterns may be quite similar. Second, differential diagnosis is metastatic hemangiopericytoma. If we have a primary in the meninges, it may have metastasis in bone, which is more common than uh, primary solitary fibrous tube. Metastatic hemangiopericytoma from meninges should always be excluded. 
is more common than primary hemangiopericytoma in bone, which is the solitary fibrous tumor. The third differential diagnosis, considering the hemangiopericytoma pattern of uh, blood vessel, is mesenchymal chondrosarcoma. Mesenchymal chondrosarcoma can have prominent hemangiopericytoma-like vascular pattern simulating solitary fibrous tumor. However, in mesenchymal chondrosarcoma, we have islets of hyaline cartilage, and the tumor may be areas of cartilaginous differentiation or S100 positive. Also, areas of small cell in mesenchymal chondrosarcoma are SOX9 positive. So, mesenchymal chondrosarcoma have prominent hemangiopericytoma-like vascular pattern simulating solitary fibrous tumor. However, unlike solitary fibrous tumor, mesenchymal chondrosarcoma is composed of round or void of spindle-shaped cells admixed with nodule of cellular hyaline cartilage. In solitary fibrous tumor, we don't have these areas of cartilage. Cartilaginous differentiation is not present in solitary fibrous tumor. In addition, immune histochemistry, solitary fibrous tumor is positive for STAT6, and mesenchymal chondrosarcoma is positive for SOX9. The last differential in solitary fibrous tumor is the phosphatoric, phosphatoric mesenchymal tumor. A phosphatoric mesenchymal tumor which is a tumor associated with, clinically with osteomalacia. Uh, this tumor can have areas showing prominent branching vascular pattern like that. However, in the phosphatoric mesenchymal tumor, uh, we have usually matrix production. We can have mixochondroid, steroid, is flexion, mineralization which is not the case in solitary fibrous tumor. In addition to the molecular marker, the neoplastic cells in phosphatoric mesenchymal tumor except express fibroblast growth factor 23, and they are not CD34 positive. So in solitary fibrous tumor, it is CD34 positive. In phosphatoric mesenchymal tumor, it is fibroblastic growth factor 23 positive. Now, for the fibrohistiocytic lesions of bone, we have benign fibrous histiocytoma and malignant fibrous histiocytoma. Benign fibrous histiocytoma is a benign lesion that is histologically resembling non ossifying fibroma. However, it occurs in sites other than those of non-ossifying fibro. So, the term benign fibrous histocytoma should be used for tumors with similar histologic feature as non-ossifying fibro that can occur in location other than the metaphysis of long bone, such as flat bones and vertex. And they occur in elder age group. If we find benign fibrous histocytoma in the epiphysis, where most of the cases have been reported, this is not benign fibrous histocytoma. It is a histologic pattern, most probably represents involutional changes in a convention, conventional giant cell tube. So if we find benign fibrous histocytoma in the epiphysis, it is an involuted giant cell tube. Last tumor is malignant fibrous histocytoma of bone. Malignant fibrous histocytoma of bone may be primary lesion or it may be secondary to a pre-existing lesion such as Paget's disease, cartilaginous neoplasm or bone necrosis. The primary malignant fibrous histocytoma may involve any bone, however, the femur is the most common site, followed by tibia and humerus, so mostly in long bone. The patient's age ranges from 6 to 81, so we have a wide range of age, with most of lesions, about 
50% of caring above 40 years. Radiologically is the radiological manifestation of any malignant tumor, ill-defined lesion causing bone expansion and cortical destruction, sometimes with soft tissue extension. So malignant fibrosis cytoma are fully circumscribed lipid lesion of a permeative moth-eating pattern of bone destruction. Destruction of the cortex is common. No special type of matrix is present, bony or cartilaginous. Most commonly, it involves the metaphyseal portion of bone. However, secondary involvement of the epiphysis is common. No periosteal new bone formation, no evidence of matrix mineralization are seen. So the tumor does not produce osteoid or chondroid matrix, so we don't have special type of malignant fibrous histocyte. Now, histologically, the tumor is formed of spindle cells and rounded histiocytic type cells or combination of the two in variant proportion. The spindle cells are arranged in a story form pattern, which is the most characteristic feature of malignant fibrous histocytes. Nuclei are oval and fascicular with mild to moderate pleomorphism. The histiocytic cells are rounded and have large oval or lobulated nuclei with prominent eosinophilic nucleolus. Some histiocytic cells contain hemosiderid or they are lipid laden. Large bizarre multinucleated cells may also be. So here, the spindle cells running or arranged in a story form pattern with pleomorphism. Here are the histiocytic areas with large nuclei, lobulated nuclei, prominent nucleoli here. Here we have story form pattern and myxoid matrix with large bizarre cells. We have histologic variants as malignant fibrous histocytoma of the soft tissue, maybe the inflammatory pattern, inflammatory uh, variant uh, that may simulate Hodgkin lymphoma. Sometimes we have large myxoid stroma be present, myxoid variant. Sometimes we have collagenized stroma to be differentiated from dysmoplastic fibroma. Sometimes the neoplastic cells may be arranged in organoid or hemangiopericytoma test pattern. And in any case, please search for a primary or for underlying lesion, such as Paget's disease or history of irradiation or bone necrosis. Here are the histological variants, the myxoid pattern, here the hemangiopericytomatous pattern, and here the collagenized pattern that may simulate dysmoplastic fibroma. For the differential diagnosis of malignant fibrous cystocytoma, especially in patients above 40 years, we have to differentiate from metastatic carcinoma, especially sarcomatoid renal cell carcinoma. In sarcomatoid renal cell carcinoma, the tumor cells are positive for cytokeratin. Sometimes malignant, fibros malignant fibrosis cytoma can express few cytokeratin inside few cells. However, in sarcomatoid renal cell carcinoma, the tumor will express more cytokeratin. Another differential diagnosis may be co confused with osteogenic sarcoma with very few malignant osteoid. This may be very confusing. The differentiation may be at times extremely difficult. However, it may be also unnecessary because both are high-grade lesions that require the same treatment and have the same prognosis. So, differentiation may be problematic but may be unnecessary as well.
sometimes in malignant fibrous tissue cytoma we can find reactive bone but if we find malignant bone it is an osteosarcoma to be regarded as a true malignant fibrous tissue cytoma tumor osteoid production must be absent so the presence of the presence of malignant osteoid is an indication of osteosarcoma thank you very much for your attendance bye